the euro was from the start uh, intended in part to force the pace of European integration to ratchet up the pressure for higher levels of labor mobility and uh, moving toward the creation of a, of a common fiscal capacity. I think the big omission was banking union. Milton Friedman, the great American economist, prophesied the challenges the euro would face. The drive for the euro has been motivated by politics, not economics. The aim has been to link Germany and France so closely as to make a future European war impossible and to set the stage for a federal United States of Europe. I believe that adoption of the euro would have the opposite effect. It would exacerbate political tensions by converting divergent shocks into divisive political issues. Fast forward two decades later, and the euro is still kicking. Many of the tension described by Friedman did cause tension within the eurozone, and yet the EU's political leadership managed to overcome them. The Euro's foremost success might actually just be its survival through the 2008 crisis, the subsequent Euro crisis and the rise of Eurosceptic populist parties across the continent. But has it managed to meet its objectives? Has the Euro made the EU more robust and more convergent economically? To take stock of this conversation, we are joined by two reputed economists, Jean Pizeniferi and Barry Eichengreen who have been writing about the euro since well before it reached our wallets. Don't forget, if you like the show, you can help us through a multiple different ways, such as sharing the show, writing a review, we always love a good review, and you can also support us for the price of a sandwich a month on our Patreon. And all our wonderful patrons have been helping us build this episode, we've been asking them some questions and some feedback, so if you want to join us on Patreon, and have this conversation with us, we'd be very glad. So thank you to both of you for joining us on the show. We're so glad to have you to talk about this important conversation. Um, Barry Eichengreen, you're a professor of economics and political science at the University of California, Berkeley, and a former senior policy advisor at the International Monetary Fund. You're a regular contributor to project syndicates and the author of many books, including your latest, In Defense of Public Debt, with the Oxford University Press, published in 2021. On one side of the line, we have Jean Pizeniferi. Professor Pizeniferi is the Tommaso Padoa Sherpa Chair at the European University Institute. He's also a senior fellow at Bruegel and a professor at Sciences Po. He's also the author of The Euro Crisis and Its Aftermath, published in 2014 for the Oxford University Press, which is our book, a book which I think will be very relevant to the conversation we'll be having today. Um, let's start with, um, with a beginning. Um, the idea of a common European monetary unit goes back to a long, long time ago. We can go even back to 1929 when the German statesman Gustav Stressmann um, imagine the European currency, but for the sake of this conversation, let's focus on, on the euro. The first serious attempts to build the euro would start in the 1980s. Uh, Barry, you've been writing about the euro since well before its creation, actually. And um, could you walk us through um, the history of the creation of the euro? Who were some of the main national actors behind it, what was the rationale behind it, and what were the steps from the moment the first conversations about the euro happened to the moment we had a banknote, a euro banknote in our wallets? I find it interesting, uh, Francois, that you go all the way back to Gustav Stresemann in 1929. Um, Stresemann was an interesting, important character, uh, prime minister, in, in, in Germany when they ended the hyperinflation and then finance minister 
in the 1920s, uh, his timing wasn't good. 1929, the eve of the Great Depression, wasn't mm -hmm. a great time to uh, advocate uh, such dramatic changes in European integration. And unlike uh, uh, Helmut Kohl in the 1980s, he didn't have a Francois Mitterrand on the French mm -hmm. side to collaborate with. So Europe descended into a world of capital controls and so forth. And I think serious talk about the Euro, Euro begins to come back in the uh, 1970s as those capital controls begin to be relaxed and exchange rates become more difficult to manage. And as the post-World War II uh, Bretton Woods system begins to disintegrate. So Europe is really faced with the challenge of keeping exchange rates within the European Union, what was then called the European Community, relatively stable in a world of high capital mobility. And uh, as it learned in the 1992-93 crisis in the European monetary system, Europe's many Bretton Woods, if you will, uh, that's devilishly hard. Keeping exchange rates stable in a world of high capital mobility is dev de devilishly difficult. Uh, so uh, that provided the impetus for either uh, going back to a less deeply integrated Europe on the one hand or moving forward to the monetary union on the other. So I'm inclined to tell the story in, in terms of deep structural factors, changes in financial markets and changes in the global environment, not so much in mm. terms of personalities, although Cole and Mitterrand were the relevant personalities. Um, Jean, what do you make of this um, grand scheme of the euro from, the, from Gustav Stressman to today? No, I, I agree that personalities played play a role at the end, but you know, the, this was more deeply, deeply rooted. And there's a question about why the Europeans, uh, you know, went and, and continued in, 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 in spite of several setbacks to push for the euro and eventually achieved it. Uh, my reading is that the uh, preference for fixed exchange rates was okay. very strong. Uh, the people in charge uh, had the, the analysis or the belief uh, that uh, floating exchange rates were incompatible with the single market, were inc incompatible with the common policy, and that therefore they had to they had to fight for 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 fixed exchange rates. And and as Barry said, um, once the the Bretton Woods system began to crumble, uh, Europeans immediately went for the the European monetary system or the snake first, and then the European monetary system, mm -hmm. the exchange rate mechanism. And then the euro. So there is a sort of line of very consistent uh, preferences. With hindsight, sort of, we, we may wonder mm. whether it was right because you know we had for twenty years the UK in the single market without ever uh, the exchange rate becoming an issue. Um, so uh, perhaps it was a sort of a too much of a. Of a reading inspired by the, the currency wars of the interwar period. I think there was another reason uh, why um, there was um, this direction very much on the French side, which is that uh, having decided that uh, ex fixed exchange rates were, were necessary, uh, the leadership had gone to the Bundesbank. Yeah. And this was perfectly understandable at a time where the Bundesbank had had its leadership in fighting against the inflation. But this was not a stable arrangement. I couldn't imagine uh, the, the, the Banque de France or Banca d'Italia following, uh, only following the Bundesbank uh, monetary policy decision and this arrangement being a stable arrangement between countries of roughly similar size. Hmm. And, you know, let, let's um, focus here for a little bit on the issue of timing. You know, the, the uh, EU or rather the, the EMU uh, read it to um, adopt the euro throughout the, the, the 1990s and eventually adopted it in, in the early 2000s. And the, the question here is, is whether in, in, in hindsight, uh, whether the EMU was ready for the euro at the time that it adopted it. You know, could, could the early 2000s 
um, economic monetary union be described as what a, what a macroeconomist call an optimal monetary zone? Of start- clearly, clearly not. Um, uh, Europe was not yet an optimum currency area in the sense of having uh, very high levels uh, of labor mobility uh, in the sense of different economies within the area suffering the same kind of aggregate demand and, and aggregate supply shocks in terms of having a single European treasury or a common fiscal capacity. Uh, but I think if uh, Europe was going to wait to put those prerequisites in place before moving to the euro, it would have never gotten there. The euro was from the start uh, intended in part to force the pace of European integration, to ratchet up the pressure for higher levels of labor mobility and uh, uh, moving toward the creation of a, of a common fiscal capacity. Uh, as we saw hints of in 2020, uh, 2021, uh, I think the big omission was banking union. What we learned after 2008 was that monetary union without banking union is highly problematic. And I'm struck by how little discussion of banking union there was before 1999. Uh I basically concur. Uh, we we had this discussion um, in the nineties uh, about whether Europe was ready or not for for monetary union, and there were uh, you know a number of important papers, including by Barry himself with Stan Bayumi, or with uh, by Olivier Blanchard and Larry Katz on the uh, on labor markets and. Uh, uh, and Jeff Sachs and Javier uh, Salai Martin on the, on the fiscal dimension. So so all that was explored, and the the decision by the Europeans was to go ahead huh. despite those warnings. I think the the mistake that was made was to not not to wait not 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 to wait until the the uh, uh, Europe was ready because it would have lasted forever. But the mistake that was was made was to uh, uh, assume that by moving to a monetary union, sort of automatically, Europe would become uh, gradually uh, an optimum currency area. So the sort of uh, um, you know, idea of uh, the, the, the movement creating uh, the, the conditions for, for optimality. Mm. And that was wrong. That was wrong. And actually, Paul Krugman had written um, in the, already in the 80s saying, no, that, guys, that's wrong. Because the more you're going to uh, integrate monetarily, the more you're going to specialize, and the more your countries are going to become uh, more di- di- divergent. Uh, but also, as Barry said, um, the, uh, nothing was done on the backing side. And I think the reason why nothing was done is, uh-huh. is really in sort of incoherent uh, behavior on the part of the Europeans, because we knew very well that a that sort of financial union, a banking union, was a logical uh, counterpart to monetary union. And it was essentially, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, the reluctance of the supervisors and the reluctance uh, of the government to sort of give up the control of their banking systems and give up the privileged access mm. to their banks that led to the situation uh, that contributed massively to the, the crisis in, in the um, um, 2010, 2011. But in addition, I, I, I do think that we scholars, academics, have to take a little bit of the blame for that. So, um, yes, Hinkley. I'd agree with Jean that uh, European officials uh, uh, came around to the view, developed the view that they needed to move faster on banking union after 1999. But again, I'm struck by the all but total absence of literature or analysis on uh, the role uh, of bank regulation in a common monetary zone before the euro was created. I agree. I agree. That was, there, yeah. there was a lack of it, yes. I mean, you know, all, all the papers I, I mentioned, there were not many on the, on the banking side. Um- Let's fast forward to, to today. Let's do a balance sheet. If, if you went back to 2001 
and listed some of the objectives um, uh, expected from the euro. How would you say the euro, the euro has lived up to those objectives? What were the expected goals? And perhaps also we can talk this down the road, but how has the um, um, European debt crisis changed the, the, the perception of the euro on kind of monetary and economic um, policy? Uh, let's start with with um, with um, with Barry, and then we'll um, go back to Jean. I, I would draw a strong contrast between the first and second decades of, of the euro. Yeah. It's clear with hindsight that the first decade was not a period uh, uh, when European economies became more robust and convergent on average. There were these massive unsustainable financial flows from the euro areas north to the, the euro areas south uh, based on unrealistic expectations of convergence, based on uh, flawed bank regulation, as we alluded to a moment ago. And the European Central Bank didn't help either in that credit boom period before 2008 or in terms of its uh, initial response to the crisis when the latter began to unfold, raising interest rates in 2011, as the ECB notoriously did, was not stabilizing. In the second decade uh, of the euro, we saw a lot of progress with the, the ECB uh, turning into a true lender of last resort, when a lender of last resort and, and uh, uh, guarantor of the integrity of the eurozone was needed. And uh, I think uh, there has been been real progress there. Uh, it's a difficult counterfactual. Jean referred to it earlier when he when he invoked the experience of the UK. How would the European Union and its member states have been affected by the subprime crisis in the US had there been no euro? One can make the case that their central banks could have responded. Uh, more swiftly than the ECB did to uh, the unfolding crisis and all would have been well or better. But one can also make the case that there would have been exchange rate chaos in in, in Europe without the euro. So I, I haven't been able to really get my mind around the counterfactual. Um, Jean, you wrote a lot about this, about the, um, the, the, the European crisis, the euro crisis, the European crisis. Um, is it fair to say that the rules that were created for the euro, especially on, on, on deficit, on making sure the ECB um, uh, couldn't essentially be a lender of last resort, is it fair to say that for the eurozone to survive, it had to burn all those rules? It had to decide the rules that were set in place were no longer fitted for the survival of the eurozone. It didn't have to burn all the rules, but it had to invent uh, new instruments. Uh, for example, there was, I mean, the, 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 the thinking behind the, the constitution of the euro was that by having, you know, extremely good sprinklers, you didn't need a fire brigade. Huh. So, so there was no thinking on how to manage a crisis. So, for example, the, the, the simple question that arose with the Greek crisis was, do we call the IMF or not? Or do we deal with the crisis yeah. without calling the IMF? And there was no answer to this question. You know, the, the, and Greece was a member of the IMF. So, so Greece, you know, uh, applied. <laughs> the first thing Greece did was sort of to, you know, to, to call the IMF and say, we have a problem. And then Europeans said, oh, but we have to, I mean, some of the Europeans, uh, Trichet especially, said, we have to deal with this crisis by ourselves, but there were no instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the decision was to call the IMF, but to have this sort of troika uh, with the IMF, the Commission and the ECB managing the conditionality jointly. And then there was a question how to finance, and we created the FSF, which was a, per a temporary structure, and finally the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, but the ESM was a purely financial instrument. And, and the question of the doctrine for intervention took a very long time to clarify because there was this idea that you could only intervene as a last resort, ultima ratio, as, uh, ultima ratio, as uh, Chancellor Merkel liked to say. So in, in, in the case of a threat to the euro, to the, to the euro itself. 
So, so all that transformed a local crisis because you know Greece was a small economy and it was a, a big problem in a small economy into something that at some point threatened the existence of, of the euro. This is sort of with hindsight, it's inc incredible. So gradually, you know, the instruments were, were put in place. So we had we had that, and then we had the question of whether the ECB could intervene, and the ECB started buying Greek bonds without you know any. Uh, without any framework for that. And then it stopped. And then it started, you know, there was a question of Italy and the question was, you know, uh. what do we do? Um, and, uh, uh, and, and then finally this uh, OMT instrument, outright monetary transaction, which doesn't mean anything, by the way, was created that to, to, to make it possible for the ECB to buy bonds. But, but this instrument was never activated. So, so you know, step by step, things moved until uh, with the latest with the COVID crisis, the ECB gained the flexibility uh, to sort of buy bonds without uh, very strict guidelines and, and de facto uh, manage the spreads. So we're not yet at the end of this, of this journey. Is it fair to say that there's been a quite clear line between the North and the South on the winners and losers of the Eurozone. Um, it, it, to be simple, is it, is it fair to say that the Hanseatic League has been, uh, you know, Northern states have been the main winners of the Eurozone, whereas the, the Club Med, as we say in French, or the, or, or the Pigs, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain, have been the main losers? Is this kind of an unfair depiction, or is there some truth to it, um, Professor Archangel? There is unfortunately some truth to it. I don't think there was anything intrinsic in the construction of the euro that uh, had to deliver that result, but it clearly has been the case that um, Greece, for example, descended into a terrible crisis starting in 2010, and that Germany has benefited on average from a more competitive exchange rate and a more robust export sector, although other factors like the rapid growth of China also contributed to, uh, to the latter. So uh, what Greece experienced, what we refer to as the Euro crisis was uh, clearly a very, very difficult experience that did pit North against South, but I wonder whether it's accurate to refer to that experience as the Euro crisis or not. Mm -hmm. um, one way that a country in Greece's position would have traditionally uh, adjusted to the sudden stop in capital flows and, and, and the need to compress a big government budget deficit would have been to devalue the currency and, and mm -hmm. the Greek government couldn't do that not having its own national, separate national currency. But the other way a uh, country would have adjusted to, to this situation of unsustainable debts would have been to restructure the debt. And the problem in Greece was that for too long after 2010, Greece was denied both options, not only devaluation, but also the necessary debt restructuring. So the problem was, again, lack of banking union. It was the leverage that the big banks uh, had over policy. Uh, German and, and, and French banks had uh, lots of uh, uh, heavy investments in Greek government bonds, Southern European government bonds. They were reluctant to see those bonds restructured. Their governments were worried about the holes in their banks' balance sheets that would have resulted. So uh, there, there was a serious problem there. There was a, a, a uneven distribution of the costs of solving that crisis in the end. But it doesn't have have to do entirely with the euro alone. Um, Professor Pizani Ferry, how do we, how do we explain this? Because there seems to be some some a bit of a of a moral vision of this um, tension between north and south. You know, on one side it seems we've got the northern ants. And the southern cicadas, um, you know, the, the hardworking north and the and the lazy south, and then the, there's kind of a, another vision, which is you know the north is being greedy and doesn't want to share the the gains of the eurozone. How do we explain this divergence between between north and south? Um, 
the, the, it's a combination of factors. First of all, uh, on, on the fact that they were winners and losers, in a way, it was recognized with the next generation EU, you know, the recovery and resilience uh, facility. If you look at the distribution of money, uh, it, it goes massively to Southern Europe. I mean, it goes massively and, and Eastern Europe. So Eastern Europe on, on reasons of you know, development, but also massively to Greece, largely to Italy. Uh, Spain is also a major beneficiary. So it's, in a way, it's a sort of ex-post recognition that something has to uh, be repaired. Now, on the, on the causes, I think uh, Barry made an important point. I mean, there were some factors that mm -hmm. were completely exogenous to the, uh, to the euro. Uh, the fact that yeah. you had, the fact first that we entered the euro um, immediately after German unification, the inflationary boom it had created, and the fact that in, in 1998, you know, remember, Germany had a current account deficit in 1998, uh, and France yeah. had a current account surplus. Yep. Um, and, and so this, it was completely upside down. And then Germany started, um, you know, adjusting uh, a, a long period of, of, of wage austerity in order to re rebuild its, its competitive position. Um, and at the same time, for countries in, in Southern Europe, some of which actually had very recently converged. Uh, the expectation initially was not that Spain and Italy would converge so fast. I mean, the expectation was that you would start with a core. And um, at some point, Spain made the decision to, to join. And so Italy had no choice. Italy couldn't let Spain get in and remain yeah. out. So they decided to join, which meant that there was a very fast uh, um, um, convergence downwards of interest rates, of bond rates, which created a sort of huge boom. And the uh, the mistake was made uh, not to not to uh, control this boom. I mean, not to through you know um, prudential means, through fiscal means, huh. uh, to limit this, this this credit boom. And and so we had this combination of factors. And at the same time, we had globalization, the China shock at the same time that weakened especially huh. uh, some some low cost producing countries within Europe. So we had a sort of perfect storm at the time, and it uh, it triggered the crisis. Now, it's true also, and I think that's perhaps what you're calling the moral argument, it's true yeah. also that some countries, some governments, did not draw the consequences of having joined a currency union. Um, joining a currency union means you have much more freedom in the short term. You can have a you know 10% current account deficit without any consequence. And that's what actually happened in Spain or what happened in Greece, even more. Uh, or, uh, but, but then, in the longer run, you can't devalue your currency. So you have a much stronger long-run discipline. And this requires a government that is sufficiently long-sighted so to, 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 to ensure that you just don't benefit from the relaxation of short-term constraints. And unfortunately, some government did not. And, and you know, that applied to several governments in, in Southern Europe. Mm -hmm. um, this, kind of, this kind of underlying tension we described with, with Southern Europe and Northern Europe, there's also a political dimension to it, because as you said, um, it wasn't a optimal monetary zone um, if we're going to use a macroeconomic term. Um, so it was a political decision to say, um, we need to do it now because we'll never be ready otherwise. The, the idea somehow is, and, and you quote um, in one of your later, later articles, in I think it was in, in Le Monde, um, you say about how you quote the intellectual from, from the medieval era, Nicolas Oresme, who said, um, the currency does not belong to a prince, it belongs to the community. There's a strong political dimension to it. Do you think the euro has helped create this kind of um, feeling of common destiny, of common belonging that was also expected of the eurozone? Um, where do you think we are on on this front, Professor um, Pizzinato? Uh, that's a very hard question. Um, the, it, it's not it's not me who quoted Nicolas Oresm. That was Hans Tittmeier, the, the the president of the Bundesbank. He he liked to quote Oresm, saying, you know. Um, it, it, at the time, it was a way to say um, you need to create a political union, basically, before you create a currency union. 
and so we did not wait. Uh, and the question was, does the causality work the, mm. the, the other way? I mean, you, by creating a monetary union, do you create a political union? Now, in the, the, the very fact of having uh, your banknotes in, in your pocket didn't change anything significant in terms of the, the feeling of, of, of belonging in the short term. So, mm-hmm. so you know, it people didn't feel more, more European or, or marginally. I mean, but I think uh, the crisis itself, there's a lesson from the crisis that no country decided to exit. So it, it actually, it, it, it bound the, the members of the Euro area together. And, you know, we're speaking at a particular time, but I'm quite sure, for example, that countries um, uh, in the, the Baltic states, the, the, the way they, they decided to join the euro, I don't think they did it on economic grounds only. Mm. They felt that belonging to the euro was an extra security uh, guarantee that uh, against Russia, mm. <laughs> um, uh, purely symbolically, uh, because, you know, having Russian troops entering the, 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 the currency zone would mean something much more than entering even the, the European Union. So I think there is a symbolic dimension there that did not manifest itself in the short run, but sort of has much more value in the in the longer run. Mm-hmm. Professor, so in the way it is a political project. Mm-hmm. Professor Green? to put the same points in a in a in a slightly different way, uh, I think there always was a, a view among European elites that monetary union will lead to will require fiscal union and Mm. fiscal union will lead to require political union. But what uh, those elites learned over time was that politicians at the European level have to speak to two different constituencies. Not only is Mm. there a a Europe-wide constituency with a shared interest in the single currency, but they have different national constituencies. Uh, constituencies to which they also have to cater in order to remain in office. And for the historical reasons we've discussed, those different national currencies have different views uh, of the nature of the problem and, and, and if there's a problem and how it should be solved. Finally, I do agree with Jean that the last decade has changed the nature of this conversation, and it has led to a realization in Greece, in Italy, in, in, in Germany, that in response to the next crisis, uh, no member state is going to leave the euro area. So it'll, it'll be necessary to politically as well as financially uh, address the problem collectively. Now, um, you know, one, one question that, that lies at the heart of uh, all uh, macroeconomics really is, is whether whether policy matters and what policymakers can, you know, to what extent they can change the economic uh, landscape. And, um, you know, for the next question, uh, you know, let, let's look at how the euro has shifted the incentives on things such as public debt, about which you've just written, Professor Eichengreen, a, a book co-authored with Asma Al-Ghanaini, Ruiz Steves, and Chris James Michener. Uh, but also about also incentives on public spending, internal devaluation, uh, perhaps beginning with uh, fiscal policy at the member state level. Uh, you know, in, in in the different member states that, that we've been discussing, and then and then uh, uh, globally, so that, uh, the euro as a whole. Starting with Professor Eichengreen. Obviously, it's very very hard to pick out the effect of the euro on uh, financial policy, fiscal policy. Uh, labor market adjustment. I think that's what you meant by internal devaluation. Given all the other things that have been going on during the first two decades of the euro, this has been the period of secular stagnation when the natural rate of interest has been trending downward, making heavier public debts sustainable, other things equal. There was the global financial crisis and now the COVID crisis. So how much difference have those things made compared? There, there have been labor market reforms in, in, in Germany and many other euro area countries. So how much difference has the euro made relative to those other things? 
to echo what was said before, I think the uh, footprint of the euro has been most visible in 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 the case of uh, capital flows within the euro area, creating incentives first for governments to, to in southern Europe to run larger budget deficits and allow um, uh, more action in their housing markets than would have been prudent uh, given our 2020 hindsight. And uh, the euro then forced them to pay the piper, pay the price once those internal capital flows unwound. The problem being, in, 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 in my view, that lack of banking union, but more broadly, that the European Central Bank came into existence in 1999 as uh, uh, a, a monetary rule and uh, an inflation fighter rather than a normal central bank that worried about uh, financial sustainability, financial uh, stability, internal imbalances, and all the rest. Uh, so I think the most important evolution over the 20 years has not been changes in levels of public debt, public spending, internal devaluation, but rather the ECB has graduated from being a monetary rule and, and inflation fighter into being a normal central bank. I think that's a very important point that Barry just made. I mean, we, we're going through very interesting times. Uh, you know, if you take the sort of longer cycles, uh, you had a cycle that started in the 80s with uh, the appointment of Paul Volcker at the uh, Fed, um, the fight against inflation um, that dominated, uh, you know, the, the, the policy agenda and that led to the, the formation of a central independent central bank uh, dedicated to fighting against inflation. Um, also, the view that fiscal policy was a secondary instrument and that fiscal policy stabilization was was not needed. Um, and 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 okay. then, obviously, at some point, we sort of transitioned to a different environment where with very low interest rates, uh, you know, the uh, monetary policy hitting the, the lower bound for interest rates, inflation being too low for a while, uh, fiscal policy becoming, uh, again, part of the, of the toolkit, the, the very complex situation we're facing with, at the same time, super low interest rates and very high debt levels and what it means for fiscal discipline. You know, the, the sort of... Uh, the basis um, uh, we, we've put in Europe, as as always, we're putting everything in in the in the text, in the legal text. In the we could call it a constitution because it's a treaty, and uh, we're going too far because um, it's uh, because of the sort of lack of trust and and, and the need to, to sort of write down everything. We're putting into the constitution something that's specific to a particular context without thinking um, uh, about the, the, the potential other context in which the same institution will have to act. And that's uh, what we are what we are going through. Um, you know, with the, um, uh, the ECB having to to change its uh, its, its focus, uh, with the, the whole the question about the fiscal capacity, um, you know, new problems uh, that are being addressed that were not anticipated at the time of the creation of the euro, and that's a very interesting moment because precisely is when the creature you know sort of escapes the the, the thoughts of its uh, its creators. Um, uh, who did not anticipate that we would be facing such problems. And I think the, the conversation around the euro has also changed in a significant way in the, very, the last few years, because especially since uh, the 2008 crisis and the follow-up in, in, in Europe, there's been a growing anti-European uh, political movement and anti-euro political movement, which grew very strong. And we all remember in 2017, um, in the runoff between Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen. Marine Le Pen f opposed uh, the Eurozone. She wanted to leave the Eurozone. Um, now, what's quite interesting is that kind of anti-Eurozone uh, feeling has mostly disappeared even on the political fringes. Uh, in Italy, it used to be a huge part of Lega. Now it's it's no longer the case. Same thing in France for Marine Le Pen or Eric Zemmour. Um, but nonetheless... It seems that there isn't huge enthusiasm either. 
in, in other words, I was reading an article by Martin Wolf on this issue saying that it's, it's not possible to leave the Eurozone. In other words, because it's a political and economic suicide. Does this mean that the euro essentially is doomed to succeed? Is there, is there literally no other way uh, forward? We have to, to despite its flaws, um, any alternative at this point would be uh, uh, monetary and economic suicide. Professor Ashingrin. In 2008, I was commissioned to write a piece on the breakup of the euro area for a National Bureau of Economic Research uh, conference mm-hmm. volume. And I wrote, it could not happen. It, uh, a country attempting to leave the euro area would precipitate the mother of all financial crises as people rushed out of its banks and, and, and financial markets in anticipation. And I argued that it would cause the mother of all political crises because mm. it would be hard for a country to leave the euro area and stay in, in, in the European Union. And staying in the European Union is widely recognized as uh, uh, of considerable value, writing what was it uh, a, a decade before Brexit. Uh, we have more evidence of, of that courtesy of Nigel Farage and friends. So I, I, I think sure. that's right. History doesn't always run in reverse and rhetoric around the euro has evolved to reflect that. Um, yes. Um, a caveat, perhaps. Uh, all the countries uh, where the question arose of, of, of leaving the euro were countries that potentially would have devalued. Never happened in a country that would revalue as a consequence. So it meant essentially for savers that the value of their of their assets would would diminish, would be would be cut by inflation, and um, and, and and so that's what populists realized that you know people didn't want them to play with the, with the value of their uh, of their of their yeah. wealth, so whatever wealth it is. I mean, even if it's very small. Now the the potentially. Uh, we never experienced uh, the, the possibility of a, of a low inflation country, a country whose exchange rate would potentially appreciate uh, uh, being tempted to leave. I'm mentioning that, obviously, because we have this ongoing debate in, in Germany uh, about the wisdom of, uh, of being in the, in the euro. Um, and, uh, and the rise uh, in, uh, in inflation... Uh, the fact that uh, now we have a relatively high inflation in Germany, uh, that we have very low interest rates, and in a country where people essentially hold saving accounts, so so basically it means that their income, their their income from from the asset is diminishing. Actually, for reasons that have little to do with the euros, they have more to do with the the level of interest rates uh, globally, creates an atmosphere um, that's potentially. Uh, potentially uh, conflictual, um, even conflictual in Germany, because obviously an, an exit of Germany from from yeah. the eurozone would would be sort of you know an atomic bomb exploding at, in the middle of Europe, but also yeah. would mean that uh, uh, necessarily uh, there would be a real appreciation uh, for for Germany that would hit um, uh, Germany's manufacturing interests. So. But, but I think we, we sort of, yes, it's true. Uh, we went through this experiment. We saw that uh, the, the populist uh, the temptation to, to, to leave um, was, was crushed by, by actually public opinion, and they've learned the lesson. Uh, we're not completely out uh, of uh, all possible scenarios. And I think what we are entering now is a sort of inflationary uh, scenario, um, we don't know if it's going to be short-lived. Uh, there are reasons to believe it, it's going to be short-lived, but perhaps not because we don't know what's going to happen also on the energy market, etc. So, so you know, uh, it's a different type of, of tension, and uh, we have to, to to watch carefully. And it's a difficult balancing act for the ECB. It, it it's a difficult uh, balancing act for the ECB to be sure. But I wonder, Jean whether uh, serious talk in, 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 in Germany about 
leaving the euro area and revaluing in order to damp down inflation, wouldn't that be inflationary in the short run in the sense that uh, capital would flow toward Germany big time in anticipation uh, uh, of revaluation? So uh, there would be an independent German central bank to respond eventually but there would be a lengthy discussion about the advisability of this move, and that discussion itself would be inflationary. You're, you're, you're right, but but you know the, what I'm saying that in a situation where uh, there would be a tension between the perception by by Germans of the uh, of the inflationary consequence of the of the, of the euro um, and the the reality of what can be done. Uh, we haven't we haven't seen this type of, of tension really. We have seen, you know, uh, relatively uh, low level uh, controversies about decisions uh, by the ECB, decisions by the Council, going to the German Constitutional Court. Um, but we have to keep in mind this ruling by the German Constitutional Court that membership in the euro is compatible with German constitution to the extent that it uh, maintains price stability. Um, that was an early ruling by the constitutional court. So I'm not, I, I, I'm sort of not saying, you know, Germany is going to, to leave and especially not in the kind of situation we're in geopolitically at present. I and mean, they, that's something we may wish to 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 go to, which is a sort of geopolitical dimension of the of the euro. But I'm saying, you know, we 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 said we we've gone through this test of of you know people advocating leaving. Yes, for some of them, not for all of them. Yeah. And, and just just for our our parting question, you've both alluded to some some of the ways in which the past twenty or twenty two years of of the eurozone will will impact the next twenty. Uh, you've mentioned uh, you know the ECB graduating from from being uh, solely concerned with inflation to being a full, full-blown full uh, central bank. You've mentioned um, some of the levers in national policy, but what are what are some other ways that you can think of just just to, to finish off um, that, you know, some, some lessons that that we can draw from the past 20 years that you, that you think will will influence the way the, the euro is run and governed in the next 20? We've, we've, we've learned that the euro area needs movement in the direction of banking union, capital markets union, a common fiscal capacity. And we've learned that these things won't happen by themselves. They need uh, to be focused on and acted upon by European policymakers. Absolutely. I agree. No, no, I, I, I agree. I agree. Professor, I think um, on, on banking union, uh, we moved, uh, but then we backtracked somehow. Uh, the uh, what has been achieved is not what the heads of state and government had committed to in in uh, uh, 2012. At the uh, when they said it's uh, it's imperative to break the doom loop between um, sovereigns and, and and banks, and uh, they launched this uh, very bold um, um, plan for for banking union. They have been, I mean, supervision has been largely integrated. Banking resolution as not really de facto, uh, you know, management of banking crisis, if you wish. Um, so, so partially, yes, there, there has been more progress on the fiscal front than uh, expected on the occasion of the, of the COVID crisis. I don't think uh, that it's a so-called Hamiltonian moment. Uh, and it's not going to be, you know, the creation of a, of a common budget in the macroeconomic sense, but certainly it has been demonstrated that when facing a major shock, there are instruments, uh, there is a possibility to rely on the, on the legal framework to engineer a, a common response, and that's very important, uh, and that was completely unexpected. So, so you know, there, are, there is learning, there is painful learning, uh, but there is learning and there is initiative. And perhaps we should be speaking also about the international role of the euro, but I would defer to to, to Barry because he's a sort of worldwide specialist of it. Yes, uh, Barry, do you think in 20 years the euro could be a global currency reserve? It could be the, the next frontier for the euro. 20 years? Um, yeah, I think that's um, conceivable. One of the uh, constraints here is that 
international markets uh, are attracted to currencies if there is an ample supply of safe, safe and liquid assets denominated in those currencies, AAA rated government bonds, in other words, to be held as reserves by central banks and treasure, treasuries. And if you look at the numbers, the outstanding stock in the euro area is small relative to, say, uh, the stock of US treasuries. Um, if Europe makes more progress in the direction of that common fiscal capacity and issues more joint and several bonds uh, guaranteed backed by the member states uh, as a group, then I think the euro will be a player on the global stage uh, along with the dollar. I, yes, I, I, I actually uh, agree. Um, I think the... I mean, it was actually wise uh, for the first 20 years not to speak uh, and not to try to turn the euro into an international currency. The euro was not ready. I mean, that's what we discussed. Um, we are sort of entering a different uh, type of world um, in which um, this question of whether it's desirable uh, that the euro, I'm not speaking of, of being becoming a rival to the dollar, but you know, being able to play um, its role as, as an international currency more more, more fully, it's, it's it's becoming an issue both monetarily and geopolitically. Um, what's missing is a safe, mostly is a safe asset. So yeah. so the uh, the initiative um, in response to COVID crisis was an important step. Uh, I agree the the sort of the volume. Is not um, is not large enough, but there is now a volume of supranational debt issued by the EU for the financing of the of this um, uh, recovery plan uh, that's uh, in high demand in, in market, and that sort of creates the embryo of a, of a safe asset. And the question is, what comes next? First, will it be rolled over without uh, you know not not being actually uh, repaid? Uh, second, will there be other ways of creating this safe asset? So that's an, one important question. The other important question is whether the ECB would be able to extend uh, swap lines uh, to central banks of countries where the euro would be in, uh, in use. So that um, the uh, what that's what we learned in the uh, in the recent crisis that the uh, it was it was vital that the Fed extended to uh, a number of partner central banks uh, swap lines so that those central banks could help their own banks trading in dollars uh, to, to get access to liquidity in dollar at a time when the, uh, the US um, uh, interbank market was dysfunctional. And so this, is, this would be a significant move for the ECB because the question then would arise, is the ECB itself backed by some sort of fiscal authority? And at present, obviously, it's not the case. Yeah, the, uh, the first rule of forecasting, of course, is give them a forecast or give them a date, but never give them both. Both. So I'm tempted to add the proviso. 20 years may be too quick. Okay, that's a nice proviso to end on. Um, thank you so much for both of you for this uh, fascinating conversation from, the, from 1929 to, to today. Um, it's been a great conversation to have you both, and I think there's a lot of good content for our listeners here. Thank you so much to you, Professor Pizanifiri. Thank you so much to Professor Bayer and Green. And to all listeners, I say you say to all of you, see you next week. So our two rock star economists, Jean Pizanifiri and Barry Eichengreen, are both out. What did you think of this retrospective look at the past 20 years of economic and monetary union in Europe, Francois? Well, it's very interesting because I've got more of a political background. I actually, um, Professor Pizanifiri was my professor at Sciences Po, so yeah. I, I did take some economics courses. What, how was he? Was he a good lecturer? He's a very good lecturer. He's a very good lecturer. Um, he's he, he he works on it a lot, so you know, it's great to have him on on the show. Um, as I was saying, there seems to be kind of a very different angle because I am kind of you know more have more of a political background than an economic background. Um, and it's quite interesting to say they kind of disregarded the, or said the individuals behind it were not as important. Um, and that's possibly true. But, you know, my understanding of it is 
there was a lot of negotiations. The Germans were uncomfortable with it because they had the Deutschmark who had a stellar reputation internationally. Mm. And they weren't really sure about, you know, pooling themselves with other countries. Yeah, well, uh, Deutschmark, which had just been, um, had just been uh, kind of painfully uh, brought into being by uh, uh, bringing together these two very different parts of Germany, yeah. which are two very different economies. So Germany's economic... Uh, unification was, uh, you know, a hard, an, an arduous process of, of its own. And despite that, the Deutschmark remained a, you know, a st- stellar currency. And so the French actually, surprisingly, were the one, retrospectively, who were pushing for it. Um, but anyway, I just thought it was interesting that they didn't focus as much on on that aspect. Um, mm. but, but it wasn't only the French, I think, who were pushing for it. I know the Italians, especially the Italian kind of centrist pro-European elites, mm. um, I forget the exact economic terms, but there's this this image in in kind of economics where some countries like to tie themselves um, mm. a bit like Odysseus would tie himself so he could hear the sirens sirens mm. without actually uh, throwing himself into the water. Um, and I think uh, to some extent within the kind of Italian European elites, they knew they would need to tie their hands to something, and the euro with all its uh, counterparts on 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 debt, on public spending, on deficits uh, would be that kind of tying they needed to make sure they kept some kind of fiscal uh, discipline. And since actually the, the past twenty years, um, Italy Italy's fiscal discipline has been actually surprisingly good. It's not very well known, but essentially the primary deficit, if you if you exclude um, the interest repayment, the primary deficit, or they have a primary surplus. Actually, they've had a primary surplus for. Thing like 17 of the past 20 years which mm. is just incredible but anyways this kind of mixture of some elites wanting to tie their hands because they want to make sure kind of more populist leanings of their country would be tempered by those rules mm. and the french who believed uh they needed this kind of currency to to weigh on international matters um yeah yeah you yeah, know and, and i think you know what i find very interesting when it comes to the euro is that the debate over the euro has um, uh, uh, unfolded uh, in very different ways in different European countries, mm. right? If you take a country like Spain or Portugal and to to a great extent Greece, or at least Greece until the financial crisis, because yep. obviously, you know, we should we should be mindful to kind of separate the pre-08, yep. you know, the, the golden the gold the golden years of, of the euro from from 2000 to 2008 or, or 2010. Uh, and then, and then, what came after that, which um, has been a, a much more complicated uh, uh, process of reform and kind of, of trying to um, reform the euro into a more workable and less crisis-prone currency. But in the in the in the um, in the first period of, of the euro, when you look at a country like Spain, I mean, Spain was you got to remember, Spain had just graduated into being a democracy in the late. 70s. Yeah. Uh, uh, Spain's economy was still by European standards almost un, un, underdeveloped. Yeah. I mean Spain's economy was um I mean I'm, I'm not even I don't want to uh, exaggerate the point but Spain was a far more even a far more rural economy than it now is. Uh it, you know it's 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 changed in very dramatic ways Sp- Spain's economy it has become more service based it has become more uh tourism based. But uh, way back in the day, you were you had an economy that was a lot more, um, um, a lot more uh, kind of a, a agrarian uh, in, in in many ways, and um, and the euro was a massive boost. I mean, for one thing, the euro did something which it can, can which we shouldn't uh, understate. It removed uh, the friction of trade because before you have a common currency, every single transaction involves changing currencies. Yeah. And when you institute the single currency across, how many how many countries were there at, at the beginning? Was, um, in the eurozone, that's a good question. Um, in the eurozone, I think uh, a bit more than a dozen, maybe. Yeah. Um, so you you totally removed uh, the barriers, and so um, and so obviously what what uh, what some uh, some of uh, the the remarks made uh, alluded to was the fact that the euro has been a very favorable currency for german industry and german yep. pensioners yep. the german uh, german um um uh, um uh, industrial sector and the german pensioner class have been uh you know major winners from this currency whereas the industry of other countries like 
France, but, but also Spain, uh, has, uh, has greatly suffered. Um, and what I think, what I wish we would have gotten more into, which is interesting because we should have also gotten into this in our previous episode on Hungary. Right. We haven't quite gotten into whether other countries are willing to join the euro. And this is going to be a huge a problem in Hungary. Hungary is now, you know, that you got, um, I think Orban's kind of position on this is we're not ready yet. Right. But some parts of the Hungarian opposition to Viktor Orban are saying we should get rid of the foreign and we should embrace right. the euro, which, which you know, some people would claim is, is madness after you know, all the, the crises that have, that have beset the eurozone. I mean, um, the, the Brits, for their part, I mean, they, they retrospectively look at their decision not to join the euro as, you know, a, a savior moment. Like, thank God we didn't join this, right? Mm. I don't have the exact list of um, countries, but um, I think I think Croatia just joined the eurozone. Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh, sorry, sorry. It's, it's going to join the, in 2023. So there's a few countries. Yeah, 1st of January 2023. Um, so there's a few countries lining up. Um, it's 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 a tough call because for some countries, I think some countries have it especially hard. I think Italy especially, because mm-hmm. what has happened is a country like Italy, if the currency is just too high for you, you can't export anything, and normally the solution will be to devalue your money. It's not a silver bullet, but usually the, the good good solution is to devalue your money. You can't do that. So what has happened actually in the past years? has been a process of internal devaluation, which mm-hmm. is a phenomenon of actually pressuring uh, wages to make sure you remain competitive on the international markets. Now, the reason why devaluations could be an issue within the Eurozone is then you could create a currency war in which everybody loses and creates a lot of uncertainty uh, across the European market. But what is interesting with internal devaluation is de facto, it has the same effect as this kind of currency war. And what's quite interesting, for example, is when you see Spain um, pressuring on, um, on on wages past decade or so, it has been at the expense of countries like Italy or countries like France who were uh, in, in the Eurozone as well. So we've seen this kind of phenomenon. And what's really interesting is the Germans kind of understood or stumbled upon this the first mm-hmm. um, when they had the Hartz uh, reform in the, under the Schroeder government in the early 2000s, which happened the same time as the introduction of the eurozone so they got this competitive edge at the moment when people could no longer devalue their currency and that really shifted the 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 european landscape and gave them an edge when the german economy wasn't doing too well before that we had this episode i think it was our second episode on the german model um 20 years ago 25 years ago germany was a sick man in europe and Mm -hmm. this kind of convergence of those um, of that internal devaluation while the euro was introduced was a bit of a, a godsend for the Germans. Um, yeah. And again, and they, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say they did it at just the right time, yeah. which was in the early 2000s when nobody uh, nobody else was doing internal devaluation. Yeah. Uh, Germany went ahead with a very liberalizing set of reforms to its yeah. labor market, as you mentioned, the, the Hartz reforms. And it ensured that um, the kind of um, the um, economic a boom that would result from these uh, looser labor rules uh, for German industry, the uh, the, the, the output um, that would uh, be produced would be sold in Southern Europe, and that's how right. Southern Europe got addicted to German cars and other yep. elements, and other and other uh, German products, um, because none of these countries none of these countries was uh, was uh, implementing austerity or structural reforms of, of the of the kind that Germany was was uh, implementing at the time. So. So, um, so the Germans were very far-sighted in a way. I, I, I want to bounce on, on one of the last points that uh, Professor Pizani Fieri made, which is he agreed with Barry Eichen Green that they, the, the euro is doomed to, 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 to success. There is no major party in France or in Italy in all this country saying we need to leave the eurozone. Mm. But those days are over for now. Even if you look at like polls, people will say we support the euro like 70, 20, 80%. So mm-hmm. there is no strong opposition to the euro. But I was reading this a, a few months ago, which I thought was quite interesting, is even the parties and the individuals within parties who will want to exit the eurozone have understood they can no longer do that openly. And so mm-hmm. there was an entire article about how some people within Salvini's party, Lega, 
were thinking about this kind of alternative plan to leave the Eurozone, which it included actually uh, pushing the Germans to leave it. They considered their best chance to actually leave the Eurozone was to um, behave in such a kind of, um, how can I say, tense, um, confrontational manner with Germany that the Germans say, we can't, we can no longer stay in this Eurozone, we need to leave it. Um, and so the kind of plan for those who were opposed to the Eurozone was actually relying on pushing the Germans out of it. Um, I don't think that's going to happen now. I think, I think the, the, that boat has sailed. Um, Lego has moderated considerably on, on the Eurozone. So mm-hmm. you know, uh, that kind of articles I'll be reading the moment Lego decided we will no longer want to leave the Eurozone, but it's been a long time since they've moderated. Yeah. Yeah. No, and you, you don't, you don't see any sort of, you know, um, any, any sort of buy-in from, from, uh, uh political parties in, in Spain or Portugal. No. I mean, um, it, it, I think the whole of the Southern Eurozone, in, including Ireland, um, you know, you've got countries, uh, that are, these are countries that have, um, whose, whose assessment of the pros and cons of the Euro over, uh, the 20 years of its, of its existence, uh, essentially, um, uh, it, 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 um, assesses the Euro positively. I mean, it, it doesn't, um, of course there's, there's been the, the crisis and the, the currency, um, is generally it's, it's, it's a very expensive one. The Euro is very expensive mm. for, for, for the Southern, uh, economies and they're not able to devalue it. So they can't export, they can't, uh, boost their exports. Yeah. But on the whole, uh, I think the, the whole Southern Eurozone is, is, has come around to the necessity of staying in the Euro. Uh, I think politically it just wouldn't have any sort of, I mean, in, in a country like Spain, it just, it doesn't, doesn't really fly. Yeah. Which, which is why the, the, um, the pigs, so to speak, which is uh, such a laughably, um, disdainful expression, but let, let's keep it for now. Um, One of the better acronyms. The better acronyms, but it's just, I don't know, it, it just says so much about her and it's just a, a horrible acronym, but anyways, um, yeah, which is why now the pigs are pressuring the Hansatic League, the Germans, to say, hey, if we actually want this this project, this struggle to uh, to succeed, we need to make sure um, some of the gains you have made are redistributed. And mm-hmm. that's been the, there's been a notable shift within Germany, especially towards the end of Angela Merkel. Um, I'm not sure whether you can call Angela Merkel this kind of um, generous, uh, far-sighted German pro-European leader. I think she realized Germany could no longer have its cake and eat it to the extent it had been doing so. Um, and now there's a bit of a shift. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway. No, no, I, w- I was just gonna, I was just gonna add to that, that, uh, German opposition to the Euro has also dwindled. Yeah. It's also market. I mean, the, the IFD from what I can gather is, uh, no longer kind of campaigning in a in a, yeah. in a big way on on the euro. It is, um, yeah, made peace with it. Yeah. Anyways, that's a wrap. Don't forget, it really helps us. You can do plenty of small things to support the show. We write a review. We always like a, a rosy, positive review. No, no one does it make us smile during the week. Um, but it also helps us with the search engine optimization. So please do that. If you're feeling especially generous today, you can sponsor us on Patreon, uh, which is actually a good point because some of the questions we we worked on this week um, were suggested by some of our patrons. Um, so if you want to join the patrons and have this conversation with us every week where we ask you for having this in such and such intellectual, such and such, such and such, politician uh what do you think we should ask him any ideas so if you want to join the patreon and have this conversation with us every week uh please join us you can support us um, for as little as a sandwich a month um so that'd be lovely to have you on if you can't do that write a review subscribe share the podcast with a friend and uh anyways thank you jorge and to all of you i say see you next week